Hello, everybody, and thanks for tuning in today. I have the phenomenal opportunity to have Ben Corson uh, on the podcast today and just a little bit about Ben. Um, I'm sure a lot of you already are familiar with him, but um, Ben is a best-selling author. He has a TV and radio personality and has over a million views on different YouTube channels. And if I understand it correctly, uh, his show is broadcast in over 180 different countries. And so, you know, he's doing a phenomenal job of outreach, but the thing that I'll tell you about Ben that um, is not necessarily an accolade, but just a testament to uh, having heard him spoke before is that the guy is just a ball of fire. Like, I absolutely love it. He brings passion, enthusiasm, and energy to everyone. And, uh, you know, the mission that he's working on right now, Hope Generation, um, is going to radically change the lives of so many and, and the world to come. So, Ben, thanks so much for being on today, brother. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I love Omaha. I love, love church. And I'm so glad this worked out, dude. Absolutely. Well, and Ben, Ben's so kind. He just got back from Florida and now gets to hang out with us. So uh, super excited to have him on here. But as everyone knows, the premise of this podcast is who knew in the moment, right? So those small or seemingly small moments in time that only when we look back, can we notice that they were the pivotal game-changing moments for what the trajectory of our lives went on to. And Ben, I know one of the first moments um, that I'm familiar with in your life was when you were in the third grade, you kind of started uh, this, you know, this path and vocation that you're on. But I guess, tell us a little bit, maybe there's something prior to that even, but certainly that story about the third grade. Yeah, I mean, my uncle was the youth pastor and he asked me to give, give a sermon And literally my sermon was just reading the story of the dry bones in Ezekiel. Like I didn't even have anything to say. I just got up there and my sermon was reading the story. I'm like, what in the world is he even doing? You know what I mean? But yeah, I think the the, the word never returns void. So it was maybe the best sermon I ever gave because I didn't (laughs) muddy it up with my own content, you know? And then, um, yeah, so that happened in third grade. And then when I was 16 years old, I started a Bible study with my friends, started traveling and speaking at 16, uh, 17, 18, really started hitting the road more heavily, uh, became a pastor my senior year of high school. I started my TV show about 10 years later and uh, my radio show a few years before that and just been hitting it hard ever since. So God's been so good. I, I remember I was at, at, in this Bay Area in San Diego And the Lord literally cast this vision over my life that I'm living today. So it's crazy when God gives you a dream, don't dismiss it because you might, you might just be really surprised with how he fulfills it. So, so let's tap into that a little bit. Um, And, you know, not everyone that listens to the podcast is that, you know, a faith believer and that that's okay. Um, You know, a lot are, but one thing that I would want to just ask you about is, that idea of discernment, right? How do you discern between what Ben wants and what he's actually hearing mm-hmm. as a message? I think that's a, uh, I mean, mm-hmm. that's a struggle for me personally, but I know that takes uh, wisdom and, and clarity. Yeah. So it says we're Salem Elohim in Genesis, which means we're the image of God. And the idea is, is that uh, the book of Proverbs says he turns the hearts of kings like he would move the bend of a river. So Salem Elohim was a, a phrase in ancient Mesopotamia used of pre, uh, priest kings. So it's saying we're a kingdom of priests when it says we're the image of God, mediating blessing to the people from God as we have dominion over the earth as kings and rule over it. So as kings, he moves our heart's desires like he would move the bend of a river. And so I believe that my dreams and his plans sync up like Bluetooth pairing devices, and we're on the same wavelength. When I enjoy the joy of being enjoyed by God, I delight myself in him. He gives me the desires of my heart because I'm secondhand dreaming his thought bubbles, breathing those in like secondhand smoking. And they're, his thought bubbles are suddenly in my mind, I have the mind of Christ, and I'm sort of walking in this dreamality. So I really believe that that's what happens when you fulfill your teleologic design, which is namely to enjoy the joy of being enjoyed by God. I love it. I love it. Now, you, uh, you're you quoted as saying one of your favorite books that, that you can read for fun is, you know, Malcolm Gladwell's Outliers. Mm-hmm. And in that, it talks about 10,000 hours to become a master of something, right? And mm-hmm. I know you said, hey, one year, I think it was one year, or I don't know, over a period of time, you're like, I want to record and track my amount of hours to see where I'm at. 
And mm-hmm. I think as you added up, you got to a little bit above 11,000. But tell me a little bit about that journey of mastery, because when you speak, it's so it's so fluent. You're able to quote things so quickly. I mean, you can tell you're just a master of knowledge there. But tell me a little bit about that journey for you. Well, so it was over a five year period when I did 11,073 okay. hours. And that was gnarly five years, man. <laughs> like there wasn't a day where I wasn't recording hours into my craft. It was just, it was really intense. And I'm so thankful for it because I really believe that, you know, when we focus on our ability, God takes care of our opportunity. And a lot of people are like wanting opportunity, but they're not focusing on really honing or crafting their ability. So, so yeah, I, I just believe we have to stop crying, start sweating, get that 10,000 hours into our craft. Even if you're a mom listening and you're like, well, what's my craft? It's raising kids perhaps. And you got very close to 10,000 hours, I imagine during this last year, sheltering in place because of COVID-19, <laughs> yeah. you know? So um, I, I really do believe in the 10,000 hour rule. Like the Beatles were playing eight hours at night, seven days a week, probably felt like eight days a week at a club in Hamburg, Germany, where they were just grinding it out. And then the, by the time they came to America, they had already played more live shows than most bands do in their entire career. So before they played that rundown club night after night, hour after hour, they were terrible. By the time they came out, they were great because they had invested blood, sweat, toil, and tears into their craft. Love that. So thinking about that specifically for you, um, you know, whether it's giving sermons, it's speaking, TV shows, podcasts, right? I mean, you, you're doing the gamut there. You, you started doing a lot of that technology stuff. I mean, well before it would be, you know, commonplace or n- very normal. So what gave you, you know, the confidence then to be like, all right, this is an avenue that I should be heading down. And now, I mean, you know, has reached so many. Well, I always knew I wanted to do TV. And then I was actually late to the game with social media, believe it or not. So we got our social or we got our TV platform much larger before we got our social media platform, which is kind of the opposite of what you would think would happen. But I really believe in the words of Jesus that the wise scholar pulls from the storehouse treasures new and old. And so we want to use every medium and means and platform possible to disseminate this message. And so we'll use the old modicums of television and radio and the new median of social media to get our message out there. So Uh, I really do believe that if we can utilize and capitalize on every means necessary to get our message out there, uh, then we're going to have a lot more, we're going to have a lot more vibrant success across a collective range of indexes than if we just focused on like doing one thing. So I think Angela Duckworth, the psychologist, put it really well. She defined uh, success as being predicated or contingent upon grit. And that idea is you know, perseverance toward very long-term goals, very long-term goals is more of an indicator for flourishing and success across a range of indexes than even social intelligence, health, IQ, or good looks. So I just think we persevered year after year after year, slogging it away, being faithful, even when we're not seeing a lot of fruit. And then at the right time, the fruit comes because we live in an era of of seeds, not switches, you know, a solical world of switches. Uh, not seeds. In Jesus's day, 90 some percent of his parables were nature-based because he was living in an agricultural society where you wouldn't see instant results. When you put a seed in the ground, he talked about a seed in his examples when he's he's talking about the word or the kingdom of God, because he understood that you have to patiently wait for the result and delayed gratification to come. And that's hard for us to understand in an instant gratification, post-industrial revolution epoch and spiral dynamic after the orange where we flick on a switch and everything turns on so it's just patient long game perseverance for very long-term goals that that is a great indicator of success and that's kind of what we did in all these various mediums of media yeah now for you i mean how do how do you juggle that right i mean we yeah you you read one thing but we live in a society that's the exact opposite i mean how are you able to stay grounded and just continue on you know with the consistency opposed to getting caught up in the you know now 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 instant gratification yeah i believe if you're consistent you'll you'll or if you're persistent you'll get it but if you're consistent you'll keep it so what we did is like like I have a team around me. I I can't, I'm not able to like run everything, whether it's 
you know, like we have a team for our books. We have a team for our TV and radio and social media. We have a team for like 40 some staff members at the church that I'm the pastor of. Like we have so many different teams we're working with. And I think that the power of delegation is so integral toward any form of focused success, because I'm not spending my time, you know, trying to juggle or navigate all these various and sundry um, MOs regarding and Ray like media, obviously that's a part of it, but I'm focused on reading. I'm po- focused on content creation. Yeah. I'm focused on writing. I'm focused on, you know, getting the, getting the meat. And um, I think keeping that focus is really essential. And, uh, and it, it like, it's, it's very essential to me. It's indispensable for me to not lose focus yep. in all of these yeah, like uh, becoming a human octopus with my tendrils all over the place or a human pizza splitting myself up into so many different slices. I just got to keep that one thing mentality, which is what the Bible says. Like David said, one thing I've desired of the Lord to see is beauty. Jesus said, one thing you lack, give everything you have and give it to the poor. Jesus said, one thing is needful. Mary has chosen the better part. Paul said, one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind, I reach forward to what lies ahead. So there's this powerful one thing mentality. Uh, in the scripture. So I, I, I believe in using all the avenues, like many different avenues with our teams. Mm-hmm. But for me personally, I focus throughout the day as much as possible on the one thing of honing the craft and building the, the hope generation. Absolutely. So there's a lot of different ways we could spark off from that. But one thing I'd be interested on is for you, as you are creating new content and you're creating, you know, your podcast and I mean, whatever it is you're going after, what is your process and how do you kind of decide how you're going to put it together and how do you refine that then? To be honest with you. And I get asked this question, not infrequently. Uh, and I I'm, I'm kind of an anomalous incident and isolated uh, case study here because I give about 10 sermons a week, honestly, w- yeah. between podcasts, radio shows, TV shoots and speaking so my, my way of putting stuff together, my modus operandi is so different when juxtaposed against like how one would normally go about it, that I'm just reading and taking in audios so frequently that when that happens, I put it in my notes, in my phone, I put it and I have like hundreds of different sermons on my notes and I just input them into the sermons and I'm yeah. just kind of go, moving at a frenetic, frantic pace to keep up with all the stuff that's happening. And right now I think I'm 40 some messages in advance of where I'm speaking right now. So I I like to be way ahead of the curve. Something that makes me just feel less, like less predisposed toward any form of anxiety is knowing like I'm way ahead of deadlines. So that that's, it's funny. I'm late to everything I show up to in the day, but with deadlines, I like to be months ahead. Um, And so so, so my way of preparing is very much frenetic, frantic, kinetic, not static, on the go, just run and gun. And, and I, that's not like a normal way, I don't, I don't think, for people to prep sermons. Right. That's awesome. Okay. So uh, this is changing gears a little bit, but I'm intrigued by the story that's behind this. Um, so you're, you're putting out content on the internet, and then somehow it gets viewed by somebody and they approach you about a TV deal. Is that right? Yeah, it was wild. Like I was praying, like, I just believe the Lord had called me to go into TV. And then I'm like, I don't know how to do that. I have no idea. How does one even go about that? And I, I'd never once been on TV before, not once. And then I I was 28 years old, uh, 27, 28, somewhere around there. And a a TV scout found me on the internet and said, let's, you know, you need to start a TV show. And so we did that. And now we have over 200 TV episodes. So it's pretty crazy. Yeah. That's amazing. That's amazing. And I love that verse, like God can open doors. No man can close. Like he just... He, like if, if we do what we can, God will do what we can't. We got to knock on doors. We got to look for opportunities. We got to put in the blood, sweat, toil, and tears. But ultimately there's some doors that only God can open. And that's something that I can testify to. Absolutely, man. That's great. That's great. So once again, talking about all the different mediums that you've been working with out there, uh, you have what three books now? 
So I wrote three books when I was 20, 21, and 22, but I don't count those. I, okay. I the, the, Those were kind of self-published through my dad's ministry, and they were they were terrible, to be honest. Um, <laughs> but but I, have two, I have two books that that were like major releases um, over the past couple of years that were like a, like real books, you know what I mean? And you're holding one right now, yes. So so Optimist Fits, we're, we're going to spend a little time talking about this. Um, so our friend Mike O'Connell is the one that turned me on to that. He and I do a little I book. I love OC. Yeah, he and I did a book exchange. And so uh, he, I gave him three books. He gave me three books. That was one of them that he had given to me. And uh, I was like, huh, this sounds interesting. And it's Optimist Fits, Igniting a Fierce Rebellion Against Hopelessness. So Ben's story, I mean, between your family, your personal life, I mean, there's definitely been trials and tragedy, right? Not, and not that no one else or other folks don't have that, but you certainly have. And, you know, in the two main books that you've put out, I think you do a great job of talking about one, how you've worked through that and overcome it, but two, just confronting the realities of it. And so would you mind spending a minute just kind of elaborating on that and talk about, you know, where the motivation for the books came from? Yeah, so Optimisfits came out of uh, a healing that I received from depression when a bunch of friends showed up with skateboards and taught me that life could be fun. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I, I often thought you had to like ontologically navel gaze your way into over processing and you know basically brooding all of the toxicity out of your soul until you emerge this place of emergence where you get spiritual enlightenment and you're no longer depressed. That wasn't how it worked for me. What, what really got me out of depression and what Optimist Fits is about is a bunch of optimistic misfits, like pretty anti-establishment people on their skateboards who were very joyful. That taught me a whole different way of living. And that's what that book specifically is about. And that book was written during one of the best seasons of my entire life. Like I was, I wrote, I wrote both those books for my phone and I wrote two more books that, that'll be coming out in the next couple of years. But basically the, the, the I, I wrote it for my phone because I'm with my friends, I'll have an adventure with them. And then I write it down, you know, and I just think that's the, the, the power of real friendship where, you know, it's not just hanging out with the people that you're expected to, or where you're around depressing people all the time, because you're not of your own volition, voluntarily making conscientious decisions to engulf and ensconce yourself with the right people. For me, I realized that I was depressed for a lot of years because I hung out with depressing people and optimism showed me that like, if you start hanging out with joyful people, it's not rocket scientists. You'll start getting, it's not rocket science. You'll start getting joyful too. Yeah. that That's such a big takeaway. And I think, you know, um, it, it, a lot of things are a choice, right? You know, the way I view the way things happen to me or what's happened to me uh, becomes a choice. And a lot of people get caught up in that and aren't willing to, you know, move past it or find what good can come mm -hmm. from it. So for you today, I mean, you know, you're, you're pretty vocal about, you know, having been through depressing states yep. and, you know, really working through that. I mean, for you today and, what's been the biggest change or how have you seen, you know, your mindset change and allowing you to kind of not, not allow that to be a stronghold on you anymore? Yeah. Well, that's what flirting with darkness is about that next book. It's, yeah. it's just 11 weapons. The middle section is 11 weapons to defeat the dark Lord of depression. And if, if I, I'll just take two minutes and yep. I'll run through the 11. Perfect. So the, the, these are the 11 weapons to defeat the dark Lord of depression that armed me to the teeth to help me win this battle. So, so you can be a walking armory too. Like, as you hear this, whoever is listening, like, I want to encourage you. The first thing is prayer walks. Like scientific research has shown if you talk to God about your hopes, fears, and dreams, it has the same effect on your brain as therapy. The second is scripture scholar scuba gear. Don't just skim off the water of the word, but de delve deep, you know, put on your scuba gear. There's over 3,500 promises in the Bible, which will help you when you're engulfed by all these problems. Number three, the magic number of greatness, which is the 10,000 hour rule. We talked about that earlier. Stop crying, start sweating. Work is not a result of the fall. No, they were called to work before they ate from the forbidden fruit, before original sin's original blessing. So put in the work. Number four, endorphins, anyone, when you exercise, <laughs> I was just doing this with OC the other day, you know, you activate these opioid receptors in your brain, which help minimize discomfort and are akin to the drug morphine with none of the negative side effects. Number five, rewrite your story. God is the author and finisher of our faith. And when we break the fourth wall and take a look into the last 
page of the book and we see that death is swallowed up in victory, we have courage in the middle of the plot when we jump back into the narrative. Number six, own your oddness. Our oddities are our commodities. Yes. Number seven, friend ventures, adventures with God, adventures with squad. Number eight, heaven. Uh, science now validates this and has majority support that all across the world, even in cultures where belief in God remains relatively low, belief in the afterlife or some persistence of consciousness beyond death maintains majority support because God put eternity in our hearts. So even death can't kill our hope. If we don't believe in resurrection, we above all men are most miserable. So heaven is huge in the face of death. Number nine is El Roy. The first time God was ever nicknamed in the Bible was by an Egyptian slave girl an immigrant who said, you are Elroy, the God who sees. And God sees what you're going through. He sees what you're enduring. He sees what you're weathering. And knowing that you're seen is huge when it comes not only to quantum mechanics and observation affecting subatomic particles, but it also affects us when we know we're observed and seen. And then number 10 is let God love on you. We live in a free enterprise capitalistic society of upward mobility where you have to earn your keep. And in the kingdom of God, it's not a meritocracy. Just let God love the heavens right into you and the despair <laughs> clean out of you. Yes. Give you a sloppy bear hug. And then number and perfect love casts out fear. And then finally, number 11 is dreamality. As you uh, realize hope deferred makes the heart sick, but when the desire comes, this is a tree of life. Don't move away from your heart. When you have a regenerated heart, move deeper into your heart because God writes his laws. Hebrew says in the table of your heart. So follow your visions and dreams. Those 11 weapons really, I kind of summed up the middle part of the book there, yeah. but uh, I dive into it in so much more depth, obviously, but right. those are the 11 things that helped me out. So one of those sticks out to me as one that I could see being difficult depending on a person's past. And it was the rewrite your story. Mm -hmm. And so if you'd spend a minute mm -hmm. just talking about that, you know, what if for a person, you know, up to this point in their life, they haven't been living the life they would like, right? Or they feel like, hey, there's just so much, you know, this, this, or this, that I don't know that I can rewrite my story to get the future I'd want. What would be, you know, some things that could help them progress forward and, you know, be able to have the, the future that, you know, they want? I think realizing that you do not have to apologize for not being what others expect you to be. Mm -hmm. And when you live from your own center, you're not going to have to ask your neighbor for direction. And I think people say, I don't know what I want to do with my life. I don't like where my story is going. I've lost the plot. I think you absolutely know what you want to do with your life. I think everybody does. We just bury it like an artifact under so much rubble of what people think. Yeah. Is this going to fail? What are my chances of succeeding? And so we say, I don't really know what I want to do. When we do, we do. And I think when you start living from your own center, you're not going to keep looking to your neighbor for direction. In fact, the new covenant is that no man need teach his neighbor, know the Lord. You're all going to know the Lord from the least to the greatest. So I think that sort of mentality uh, will help you to, to get your, your story back on the right track. That's great. That, that's a huge help. Now, also kind of segueing and thinking about that for for people that get input from, you know, close friends or a close circle, you know, how do you balance that? They may be giving you something that, that truly is their opinion, but it's to protect you and maybe not for you to get to have your best, right? Because they, you know, as caring about you want to protect you. How do you, you know, encourage someone to, you know, listen, but yet, you know, focus in on what they want, but also what they're hearing from God. In the multitude of counselors, there's safety, 100%. Like, I, one of the things that helped me out of depression was therapy. I went to a couple of different counselors. One of them wasn't a good fit. The other was a great fit. And, like, I love to get people speaking into my life. Even yesterday, I was picking my friend, one of, one of my good friends, his name's Rich. I was just picking his brain and, like, really having him invest into me. And I, I love doing that. But at the same time, like, there comes the moment where it's just you and your own spirit. Yes. And it's you and God and you got to like, you got to go, you got to decide, are you going to leave the village, follow the wizard into the hero's journey? Or are you going to stay in the village and just say, I'm going to cycle a recycled past of my ancestors. And at a, at a certain point, you got to say, you know what, I'm going to step into the unknown. There's this verse where it says Abraham left. It's such two powerful words, but like Abraham left 
because back then you didn't do that in the it's sort of the purple blue spiral dynamics, shake your rain stick off or goat's blood, do a rain <laughs> dance, hope yeah. that the gods will give you favor, do what your ancestors did, ply the trade of your fathers. Like you wouldn't just go get up and leave and do something different. But it says Abraham went not knowing where he was going, looking for a city with foundations whose builder and maker is God. There comes the moment in time where you listen to people, you weigh their advice, but then ultimately it's between you and God at the end of the day. And you got to say, am I going to embark on this hero's journey? Am I going to leave the village? Because despair is the belief that tomorrow is going to be no different than today. But hope says, I wonder what's out there. And then you start going. I love that. I absolutely love that, man. Well, uh, so a pointed question I always like to ask folks is this. Now, Ben, there's, it's this idea and I call it blissful dissatisfaction, okay? And for a lot of people, they reach their first goal and it's kind of where they plateau, right? Hey, I hit a goal and now I'm just mm -hmm. gonna stay at this level. Then there's the complete mm -hmm. opposite type of a person and that type of person is constantly searching and trying to accomplish the next thing and they never take time to mm -hmm. be appreciative of all they've accomplished leading up to that point because they're so focused on the next. You yourself are, you know, so accomplished at such a young age. How do you balance that of like, you know, being, you know, happy with what you've already accomplished but still having that desire for more? Enjoying where you're at on the way to where you're going. So you enjoy where you're at on the way to where you're going. I, I think gratitude is helpful for your medial prefrontal cortex and giving generously to a cause. And the, the Thanksgiving gratitude is actually really deleterious toward mental illness. It's actually injurious toward depression. Like it helps you be happier being thankful. So I think stopping and celebrating wins and being like, thank you, God. Wow, look at what you've done. That will actually, th thankfulness and gratitude will propel you forward to want to do more. Because you're like, like, like if, if you feel overwhelmed, you're just like, I'm not going to do anything. You're just going to lay in bed. But if you're like, wow, look at all this stuff that God's already accomplished. Like, why not just get another cherry on top of the cake? And then you get that and you're like, why not get another one? And then you get in the best sense of the word kind of greedy for, for <laughs> wins for the kingdom. And you're just like, let's keep going. And right. it's really fun. It, like it, it's, it's encyclical and it starts to spread and it starts to sort of have a compound interest and you just keep building. So I, that's why I like to just recount all the good things that God has done in my life because that galvanizes me forward into the saying of words and the doer of deeds to actually build it up more. I love it. I absolutely love it. Then last pointed question, Ben, uh, for sake of time, in your circle of people, whether that's someone that's going to join your uh, team or that's someone that would be, you know, in your close friend group, what is one or two qualities or characteristics that you always make sure they have? Well, that's a great question, but there's two separate questions, that, at least to me. Yeah. Are you saying for a team, for like the Hope Generation team, or are you saying for my friend group that I'm just sending it with? Because yeah, some, I show, those are two let, separate things. Yeah, let's have you answer both ways. Okay, cool. Uh, for the Hope Generation team, I'm looking for creative people who are disciplined, driven, and are working hard with the knowledge that our goal is to not just do a nine to five thing, but to spread hope to the world. And that's a real privilege that we get to be a part of that. And people who recognize that and have that mindset. Uh, and, and honestly, just hard work hitting deadlines, like creatives that hit deadlines. That's not an easy combo to find. So right. sometimes you lock some horns to get there. <laughs> the, the, the third one is, uh, or the, the second one is with friend group. Um, Honestly, dude, like most of my friends are, are world-class at something. Like I started yeah. realizing this over the, over the years, like one of my best friends was in the NBA. Uh, another one of my best friends is, is a rock star in a band called sleeping with sirens. I was just messaging him before this, like a couple hours ago. Um, another one of my best good friends is UFC fighter, a professional scooter, scooter rider. One of my best, best friends is a Navy SEAL. Uh, you know, like I just, I, I just really, I really love being around people who go your pace and keep yeah. your clip. And that's, that's big to me is like people who I'm not 
like having to say, come on, you know, but yep. like we look over at each other and we're like, I'm get, like, who's getting, who's faster, you know, right. <laughs> that's what I, that's what I love. And, and not always that, but like some of them are just super creative, like really great videographers or skateboarders, you know what I mean? Or like, I, I just love being around people who push me toward two things, more excellence and more joy. Yeah. And um, most of my friends just really love God. And I think those qualities really are, are fun to see uh, when it comes to, to investing in those deliberate relation, interpersonal relationships and friendships. That's awesome. Well, Ben, it's been a privilege having you on and he's wearing a shirt and it says hope generation. And that's what he's yeah, on dude. now. And I mean, <laughs> It, it, it's such a cool message. Uh, you know, it's the idea that we can be people that are generating hope, but then also there's a whole new generation. So there is hope, yes. right? Yes. Yeah, that's good. And that it's a play on words. Like generation can mean creation. Like you're a progenitor, you're a father, you know? So you want to generate hope as an individual. And that's what hope generation is. We want it to reach the individual, but then we want it to, ripple out and bleed into an aggregate a conglomerate of a whole generation that has hope. So that's the goal. I love it. I love it. Well, very good. Well, everybody, I mean, I told you he's enthusiastic and he's going to bring the fire today. And so Ben, thanks so much for being on, man. And it was a absolute privilege to have you on here.